and praise the Lord next week. And so this morning, we will come to God um, and study His Word with the theme of God faithfully. That's wrong. Sorry. It is um, the joy and pain of the uh, faith, uh, life of faith. He did not change the English um, translation there, but it is the joy and the pains of the life of faith. So let us follow the word of God in Genesis 21, verse 1 to 21. The Lord visited Sarah as he had said, and the Lord did to Sarah as he had promised. And Sarah conceived and bore Abraham a son in his old age at the time of which God had spoken to him. Abraham called the name of his son who was born to him, whom Sarah bore him, Isaac. And Abraham circumcised his son Isaac when he was eight days old, as God had commanded him. Abraham was a hundred years old when his son Isaac was born to him. And Sarah said, God has made laughter for me. Everyone who hears will laugh over me. And she said, Who would have said to Abraham that Sarah would nurse children? Yet I have borne him a son in his old age. And the child grew and was weaned. And Abraham made a great feast on the day that Isaac was weaned. So she said to Abraham, Cast out the slave woman with her son, for the son of the slave woman shall not be heir with my son Isaac. And the thing was very displeasing to Abraham on account of his son. But God said to Abraham, Be not displeased because of the boy and because of your slave woman. Whatever Sarah says to you, do as she tells you. For through Isaac shall your offspring be named. And I will make a nation of the son of the slave woman also, because he is your offspring. So Abraham rose early in the morning and took bread and a skin of water and gave it to Hagar, putting it on her shoulder along with the child and sent her away. And she departed and wandered in the wilderness of Beersheba. When the water in the skin was gone, she put the child under one of the trees. Then she went and sat down opposite him a good way off, about the distance of a bow shot. For she said, Let me not look on the death of the child. And as she sat opposite him, she lifted up her eyes and cried. And God heard the voice of the boy. And the angel of God called to Hagar from heaven and said to her, What troubles you, Hagar? Fear not, for God has heard the voice of the boy where he is. Up, lift up the boy and hold him fast with your hand, for I will make him into a great nation. Then God opened her eyes, and she saw a well of water, and she went and filled the skin with water and gave the boy a drink. And God was with the boy, and he grew up. He lived in the wilderness and became an expert with the bow. He lived in the wilderness of Paran, and his mother took a wife for him from the land of Egypt. Our Father, we come to you this morning. Have mercy upon us, Lord. Open our eyes and hearts so that we can see the glory of the Lord in his word. And that we will see your glory, Father, on the face of the Lord Jesus Christ. Thank you, Lord. And Lord, we pray that you give us a heart, a humble heart to submit to you so that we will be willing to do your will. Though it is very difficult, yet, Lord, you have told Abraham to send his son away. Lord, have mercy on us so that we with our, with our heart of righteousness preach your word and that we will have a humble heart to receive your word. Reign through this time that may your Holy Spirit, the spirit of truth, so that my words and our meditations before you would be pleasing to you. Give us, Lord, your grace and power to live according to your word. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. In Genesis 21 here, Abraham had 
experienced joy and pain in the life of faith. The story of Isaac being born and Ishmael being sent away teaches us the joy of the life of faith to receive what only God can give to us. And the pain is separated from things that we can that we do on our own. So we, first of all, we see that the joy is only the joy that God gives to us, the joy of receiving what only God can give. Can give. That's saving grace. When the Lord can do great things for you, you we, we rejoice in, and we, others rejoice with us. When Isaac was born, Abraham and Sarah had great joy and they had laughter and they named the child Isaac, which means laughter or laugh, uh, laughter. So in uh, verse 6, Sarah said, God has made laughter for me. Whoever, everyone who hears will laugh over me. Laughter is just something that is natural for those who follow the Lord. Of a family, a Christian family, of each church, of each Bible study that we have with one another, laughter speaks out the great things that God has done for us. And so we have joy. And so that joy is just shows forth naturally through laughter. Sarah received the blessing from the Lord, and it showed forth, erupted through her laughter. And God has made laughter for me. Everyone who hears will laugh for me over me. There are three aspects of joy that we see that we only that we see that only God can do for us first of all we rejoice because we know that what God promised he will do do you believe that that what God promised he will do for sure he will accomplish what he has promised us God blessed Sarah but he also said it says that the Lord did to Sarah as he had promised. In verse 1, the Lord visited Sarah as he had said, and the Lord did to Sarah as he had promised. The Lord God always keep his promises. My brother says, God may not be on time, but he's never late. What does it mean that he's not on time? That is, now he's not doing us according to my will, but he's never be late. So God gives us the grace and he accomplishes what he has promised us. The journey of following Christ is something that we just dig deep and enjoy the promises that God has in the Bible. When we read the Word of God, God has so many promises for us in His Word. And if we don't read the Word of God, if we don't dive deeply into it, we will not know those promises, and we will not receive it as our own, and we will not enjoy the fulfillment of God's promises for us. God promised that Abraham and Sarah, and He accomplished what He had promised. And so the same, God promises us so many precious promises in His Word, and we know for sure that He will accomplish it. He will fulfill His promise. So think about at least one promise that you have read in the Word of God. One promise. If you have able to think of one promise in the Word of God's Word, raise your hand. Raise your hand if you can think of one of God's promises. Okay. What? You, you, you haven't? Uh, there's so many promises that the Lord has. Raise your hand if you do. No, at least one promise. And now, I'd like to share with you, share what one of those promises are. To me, God says that I can do all things through, through Him who strengthens me. And so I can do that. God promises that, and so I believe that. Is there anyone here? Eh, this is what God has promised. God promised it, and so we can accept it for our own. So many promises, right? So read it. Read God's Word. Wherever, wherever God has a promise that He promised to His people, then accept it for yourself. Receive it as yourself. And then write it down. Memorize it and say, Lord, you promised this. So Lord, fulfill your promise to me. And then wait upon the Lord to fulfill His promise. Yes. And so, the blessed life, our blessed life is a life where we seek and 
study deeply and accept His word, His promises for us, and then we will see that God is one who keeps His promises for us. Those promises are like treasures, treasures that are hidden, that are、um, buried, and then those who seek it, it's not easy to find.、Uh, you know, but the Lord says that. Seek and you will find. Knock and it will be open to you. So the Lord has、uh, hidden His promises in His Word, but it's not difficult to find. If you seek, you will find it. In Second Corinthians one twenty says, "For all the promises of God find their yes in Him. All the promises of God find their yes in Him. That is, He will keep His promises. He would." Fulfill His promises. We don't receive it is because we haven't received it for ourselves. God does not lie. God never speaks the untruth. He is the true God. If He says it, then it, He means it. So what God promises, He will fulfill. You can have the joy and peace because we know that whatever God promises, He will keep His promise and accomplish it. Just as God gives promises to give us eternal life when we place our trust in Him, we will no longer have to fear death or of condemnation and punishment in hell. But the Lord has forgiven us of our sins in the Lord Jesus Christ. We will no longer have the guilt of sin on us because all our sins have been cleansed at the cross. But when God, but God also promises that He takes away all our fears when we cast all our fears upon Him. The Lord says, "Be anxious of nothing, but in all things with prayer and supplication, in thanksgiving, lift up your prayer request to the Lord." Those are the precious promises that the Lord gives us. We no longer have to be f- fearful and anxious. Give all your anxieties to the Lord. For the Lord promises, He will protect us. The Lord is our fortress. He is our shield. He is our shelter. So He will protect us. Believe in God's word, and then we can cast out any fear and anxiety. And what God promises, He will accomplish in His own time. Sarah was of birth and bore a child to Abraham in the old age. Exactly at the time that God has promised, verse two says, "And Sarah conceived and bore Abraham a son in his old age, at the time of what? At the time of which God has spoken to him. At the right time, God will bless you what He has promised. God does not work according to our schedule, but according to His schedule. According to us." Twenty-five years, Abraham waited for the birth of Isaac. It's a, such a long time, a quarter of a century, that Abraham and Sarah had to wait for the birth of Isaac. That is a long time to wait upon the Lord to to do His work, and he waited so long where his neck was probably so lengthened and stretched out. But according to the Lord, it is at His time that He will accomplish His promise. It's not that because we wait upon Him, wait upon Him, that He has to hasten to accomplish His will. So therefore, we need to be patient, to trust in the promise of the Lord. Two thousand years later is when the seed of Abraham. That is Jesus Christ was born. That is a long time, two thousand years, that they the Israelites had to wait from one generation to the next generation. Two thousand years later, Jesus was born. And was God late in giving His Son to the world? No, God waited for the right time to send His Son into the world. In Galatians four four, but when the fullness of time had come, you see that's so important. But when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth the Son. So maybe you have waited upon the Lord many many years. Maybe you have to leave this life and don't see the promise of God being accomplished. But you will have great joy to know that what God has promised, He will accomplish at His right time. When is the right time for the Lord? 
maybe there are many factors that will play in to the time of God. But there is one factor that we know for sure. That is, God will accomplish His promise to us when we totally depend on Him. When Abraham and Sarah totally relied on the Lord and no longer rely, rely on their own strength or abilities and not rely on Hagar to, to give birth to Ishmael, at that time, God said, Sarah will give a, a child. God gave Isaac to Abraham and Sarah when they have come to a point where they were no longer could give birth. A hundred years old. How? 90 years old. How can you give birth and breastfeed a child? But that's amazing, right? There's three three times in this passage that emphasize that Abraham was old or of age. And there's two places that I'll share with you here in verse 2 and verse uh, 5. And Sarah conceived and bore Abraham a son in his old age. In verse 5, Abraham was a hundred years old when his son Isaac was born to him. If they received the promised child, then it totally has to be what God does. Only God can accomplish it. And because of that, they rejoice to know that that can only be accomplished by God and God alone, for it was beyond their natural means. The Lord wants us to come to the point where we totally depend on God, that we know that we are, are powerless. We cannot do what God wants us to do. We cannot repent for ourselves. We cannot come by ourselves to the Lord. Only God drawing us to us, then we can come to Him. So to come to the Lord and ask Him, Lord, draw me close to You. Draw me to You. Give me a heart of repentance. Help me to focus on You. Let me see the worth in You and that You are the reason that I live, that I can live everything, leave everything and follow You. Only when we acknowledge that we, there is nothing in us, nothing at all in us that we can do for the Lord. And when we are so weak to the weakest like that, that is when God will accomplish His will, His, His promise. God has to see if that person is weak enough for Him to use. It's not the strong that God will use. Only those who are weak when they cannot do anything, then God will use that person, that all the glory be to God. Here we see that Abraham, it was time, came time for Abraham and Sarah, when they are just so weak and old and has no strength left, God gave them what only God can accomplish. And God accomplishes when we totally depend on Him. When we totally depend on Him, that means that we are not passive. That doesn't mean that we are passive. Agree? Of course, Abraham and, Isaac, uh, Abraham and Sarah had to be together, right, in order to have Isaac. But if they don't have, if, if God doesn't conceive them, then they won't. Be. So the, th the thing is that we have to actively obey the Lord and do what we know we need to do and let God do what only He can do. To rely totally on the Lord to have the power to be successful and accomplished. Our natural being does not want us to rely on anybody, that we ourselves can resolve everything. I must be the one to light the torch to find the truth. I must try my best to be a good person. I must try my best to save myself from this this situation. Everything is in my effort. No reliance to anybody. No reliance on anyone. That is the pride of life. But God wants us to come to the point where we have to admit that we are powerless. If God does not intercede, intervene, we cannot do anything. Our natural being does not want to rely on anybody. And it causes us to have a tendency to rely on our own strength. Abraham relied on the Lord for Isaac, but he also relied on uh, Ishmael, right? Because if anything happened to Isaac, there's Ishmael. But, so, but therefore, God said, Ishmael must go. And that is the pain. That is the pain of the 
life of faith. If there's anything that we are relying on, relying on the uh, spare tire in the car, whenever we're stuck, we take it out and use. No, that's it. Take it away. Cast it out. So the event of God having Sarah cast out or um, uh, send away Hagar and Ishmael it was a pain in his life. Although the Bible does not record it, because Well, in a way, the the words of Sarah made his heart pain. He was painful because of it, because Ishmael was his son. In verse, in verse 11 says, these words made Abraham hurt or caused pain to him because that was his son. Abraham loved this child for how many years? More than 10 years. 15, 12 years, I'm not know, sure, but he had this child, but he loved this child, taught this child about life, about how to hunt, how to be a shepherd, and how to take care of things. And now God says to send him away? It hurts. It's a pain. Maybe tears will come down on his face his wrinkled face when God told him to send Hagar away. Maybe this is the last time that he will see his child that he has loved for maybe 16 years. Though, no matter how much he trusted in the Lord, yet such an event like this probably caused him a lot of pain. And this pain, you know, of many months, and probably would never depart from him, this pain. Though Abraham had great joy in Isaac, yet he has this pain, and, and only God can comfort that pain. And we see this, that we need to disconnect with the old life, with the things that we have accomplished, with the things that we have done with our own natural self. Because there is always conflict between self-righteousness and God's grace. The point that Isaac was born was a joy, but also brought about pain. In verse 10, And the child grew and was weaned, and Abraham made a great feast on the day that Isaac was weaned. So she said to Abraham, Cast out this slave woman with her son, for the son of this slave woman shall not be heir with my son Isaac. And the thing was very displeasing to Abraham on account of his son. So Ishmael was not just joking around, but he was like laughing, mocking. He was mocking Isaac. When Ishmael, so we see that there's a, a spiritual lesson here. It, we see that there's an ag- allegory here to understand this in Galatians 4, verse 29. But just as at that time, he who was born according to the flesh persecuted him who was born according to the Spirit, so also it is now. This is talking about the f- which child was of the flesh. That was Ishmael, right, of the flesh. And the one who was born according to the Spirit was Isaac. And the one who was of the flesh persecuted the one who was of the Spirit, so also it is now. We see that those who gear towards Judaism They are proud of what they can accomplish through the law, through the commandments of um, that Moses was given, and the law. And they did not place their trust in the Lord. They were proud. Those who are in Christ, they are persecuted by those who follow the commandments and the laws. But praise the Lord in Philippians three three. For we are the circumcision who worship by the Spirit of God and glory in Christ Jesus and put no confidence in the flesh. And as the Apostle uh, Paul says in Galatians 5.17, the desires of the flesh are against the Spirit, and the desires of the Spirit are against the flesh, for these are opposed to each other. Ishmael represented the flesh, things that we accomplish for ourselves. Isaac represented grace, 
things that only God can accomplish for us. If we want to have the God's grace, we need to cast out anything of the flesh, to send it away, to disconnect with it, that we it shouldn't have nothing to do with the life of faith of a Christian. The life of faith of the Christian, there are conflicts of those who are so religious. They are so religious, but they don't understand that they need to die to themselves and to live for the glory of the Lord that's important. So therefore, they live according to the flesh. That is, they rely on their own strength, their own goodness to become better, to become um, good, to become a person full of love by their own strength and power. Those people will persecute those who don't do that. Why don't you try to be better? Why don't you try to be holy? Why don't you try to be more loving? Why don't you try to be more righteous? Why don't you try to be more just? No, it is not by our own effort, but it is by the life of the Lord Jesus Christ in us, revealed through us, not by our own strength and power and effort. When we know that in us, there is nothing good in us, and that only the only good that we have is the Lord Jesus Christ. He in us. He is our righteousness. He is our holiness. He is our peace. He is all in all for us. When only we hold on to the Lord Jesus Christ alone and He shows forth His love in us and through us, then the beauty of the Lord will be reflected through us, not by our own effort. And so there is a conflict between the two, the conflict between the desires of the flesh, things that we do by, that we're able to do by our own strength, and the grace of the Lord, only what God can do for us. What do we rely on? Do we rely on our own flesh, or do we rely on the grace of the Lord? This is the decision that we must make. And so we will deal with this conflict by um, the point that living with the flesh, with the self, is something that we cannot accept. We cannot play around with. We cannot rely on our own strength and then rely on the God's grace. It is like uh, two boats. One boat has a lot of holes in it on this side. And on the other one, it's a good boat. It's a perfect boat, no holes. And you put one foot on this one and one foot on the other What happens to you? This one will sink and you will fall. If we rely on our own strength and rely on the Lord Jesus Christ also, sooner or later you're going to fall. And so now what must we do? We need to step over onto the perfect boat. That is, we need to give our whole life to the Lord Jesus Christ, totally to Him, so that He will accomplish His will in our lives. To give us salvation, complete salvation, that only the Lord Jesus can give to us. We need to cast out, take, a, do away with our own self, with our own efforts, so that we rely only on the Lord. Amen. We are like people who who has conflicts. We actually are the people who have conflicts between the old self and the new self, but that old self must be cast out in our lives. Everything that belongs to the old self, the old life, such as it takes away the joy of Abraham when he relied on his own effort to have a child by him, himself. He had hope in Ishmael, he said, this child will be my descendants, my great and mighty people. But when God gave Isaac to Abraham, Abraham said, of only God can also bless Ishmael to come to the Lord and to rely on the Lord and hoping that, Lord, you will bless my efforts, bless whatever I do so that I will have a righteous life and try to live a more holy life by my own strength. Bless me, Lord, so that what I, my efforts will become good. No, God would not do that. For what God does in us, His righteousness revealed through us, His love revealed in us and through us will have value. Whatever belongs to us has no value. The verse in Isaiah says, our righteousness is like what? It's like rubbish, rags and rubbish. So we need to take off the rubbish the ru uh, and 
rags and put on the righteousness of the Lord. Only Jesus Christ can come to God the Father, and only when we come to the God the Father and covered by the Lord Jesus Christ, then we can come to the God the Father. There is nothing left old in us. We need to cast them out of our lives. The Lord Abraham wanted to keep Ishmael, but God says you must send him away. So, to send things away, to to to. To do away with our old self is painful for us. That is, the desires, our own desires, and things that come from our old self that we have to cast it out. It hurts. It hurts to disconnect to those things, things that we have accomplished. No longer do we rely on ourselves, but we rely on God. There are many times I have witnessed to people they don't want to rely on God. They're proud that they are a good person, and so they say. I'm a good person, but according to their eyes, before God, they are sinners. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. To say no to yourself and to submit to the Lord, to submit to the Lord, so that His Holy Spirit will. Will grow forth his fruits of the spirit in us. This is a process. It is a continual process, and the Lord will trim us so that we, the fruit of the spirit, will bear fruit in us. Abraham did not understand why. Why God want him to send Ishmael away? Maybe he did not understand later why he is to. Uh, sacrifice Isaac to God, though he did not understand. Yet he obeyed God. There are some things that God tells us to obey. We don't understand, but we need to obey Him. Ladies and gentlemen, there is always conflicts between my flesh, that is, what I can do by my own efforts, and with the Holy Spirit. Which only God can do for me, and the only way we can resolve this conflict is what is to cast away the flesh, to cast away anything that we can do by ourselves, by our own strength and efforts. In Galatians five sixteen says, "Walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh." Walk. By the Lord, rely on the salvation and grace of the Lord. Never, never rely on our own strength and efforts. God casts away from any us from anything that keeps us from following Him. To be trimmed and to be, you know, in a pruned. Yes, to be pruned. It hurts. It hurts to be pruned. So. But he needs to do it in order for us to bear fruit. The Lord Jesus said, "I am the true vine. My Father is the vi vine dresser. Who, uh, whichever vine does not branch does not bear fruit, I will trim it and prune it and cut cast out. If we are not in Christ, God will cut us off. But because Jesus is in us, He will prune us. He will." Trim us so that we will bear fruit. Maybe in your nature there is still pride, there is still selfishness, there is still jealousy, there is still things that are not pleasing to the Lord, things that prevent you from the righteousness and the love of God being revealed in you. So God will prune you, and when you are pruned or trimmed, it hurts, but it is in His will and for our own good. The process of pruning can. Hurt, but God wants us to cast out all sins from us, and He uses a picture that is so, so lively, He and so vivid. What does He say in Matthew five twenty nine? If your right eye causes you to sin, tear it out and throw it away. That means you have to disconnect totally from your sin and your flesh. And yourself, in Matthew five twenty nine, if your right eye causes you to sin, tear it out and throw it away. For it is better that you lose one、uh, one of your members than that your whole body be thrown into hell. And verse thirty, and if your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off and throw it away. For it is better that you lose one of your members than that your whole body go into hell. Here, God doesn't tell you to. Truly, do that to pick out your eye and cast it away, or cut off your arm. No, don't do that at home. 
what God is saying here is that we need to disconnect with sin. We cannot play around, play around and joke with it. Oh, let me just sin a little bit and then let me repent. No, God says no. If God teaches us something, we need to obey and cast it away, cut it off, whatever it is that causes us to sin. In a Christian movie, I forgot the name of it. There was this man, he uh, enjoyed what, um, looking at pornography. And when God uh, convicted him, he took his whole laptop, a computer, and tossed it down on the ground. That is to disconnect with sin. Cast all, let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and slander be put away from you along with all malice. Ephesians 4.31. We need to cut it all off. James 1.19-21. Let every person be quick to hear, slow to speak, slow to anger, for the anger of man does not produce the righteousness of God. Therefore, what must we do? Put away all filthiness and rampant wickedness. To follow Christ, we need to cut off the old self, the sin for self. When we obey and submit to the Lord, we will receive good results. The first is that the Lord will comfort us in our, in our pain. He will. We cry because we see our, the evil in us and we repent of our sins. And we come to the Lord, and He will comfort our pain. The Lord came to Abraham, and the Lord said, And I will make a nation of the son of the slave woman also, because he is your offspring. We cannot use this uh, verse to uh, use it as an excuse so that our uh, the, the flesh will become a great nation. No. We see the principle here is that God comforted Abraham when he had to go through the pain where he had to disconnect with his, his child. The Lord allows us to go through the painful times, but he does it with love and compassion. When we have to leave our loved ones to follow Christ, we had to pay a great price, and it is a painful price. When I went to Vietnam in, um, and visited a cousin of mine who served the Lord in Phang Ri, and he said that there is this missionary, um, this professor of a, of a um, college, and his family came from a Muslim family. And when he came to know the Lord, he placed his faith in the Lord. And do you know what happened to him? His family, his wife, his children. What do you call it? Hmm? Yeah, like uh, disowned him, basically disowned him. And the whole village, the whole town cast him out. But was he truly lonely? Was he lonely? Was he alone? No, he had the Lord, he had the family of God. He said that if everyone who has left houses or brothers or sisters or father or mother or children or lands for my name's sake will receive a hundredfold and will inherit eternal life. The Lord pay back manyfold, hundredfold. So we're willing to pay the price to lose, lose your house, your brother, sisters, your father, mother, everybody. But it is so small, it is a great loss, but it is a small comparison to what we get in the Lord Jesus Christ and eternal life. And the Lord says that if you lose all those things, you lose all your possessions and your brother and sisters and father and mother and children, the Lord says what? You will receive a hundredfold and will inherit eternal life. That is the price that we have to pay for eternal life. It is worth our the payment. If you compare it to eternal life, all those things, what worth is it? It is not worth much, right? If you compare it to eternal life. So that professor was willing to pay the price.
Uh, the, the Lord tells us to nail ourselves to the cross. We cannot do that by our own strength, but only the Lord can help us. But the verb here is that we must nail it. The verb is this verb is a positive verb that we must do is an active verb, active. That is, to nail ourselves is an active verb that we continually must do, that we must nail ourselves to the cross. The, you know, to die on the cross, to be nailed to the cross is a long death. If you are shot, you quickly or die, you die quickly. But when you nail on the cross, you die slowly. Maybe two days, then you will die. When I was in Campton, and the enemies came in, and in Campton, and they took prison, a priest, and they nailed him to a, a wood, a wooden panel, and he was stretched out for two days it took for him to die. When we face our old self, our old nature, and we rely on our own efforts and our own goodness, we need to cast it out. Paul said to the Galatians, you foolish men, you started with the Holy Spirit and now you rely on your own strength. It is very easy for each one of us each day to hear the deceitfulness of the devil so that we rely on our own self instead of relying totally on the Lord. Galatians 5.24, And those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires on the cross. Though when we cru crucify ourselves to the cross, it is very painful, yet the Lord, His Word comforts us, for we know that the result is that we have the fruits of the Holy Spirit. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things there is no law. First of all, the Lord comforts us. He comforts us and He also gives us fully His blessings. When Ishmael left, then God accomplished the promise that He had promised to Abraham. His family no longer had conflicts or uh, between uh, the mother and son of Sarah and Hagar. The child of the promise, the child of freedom, is no longer the child of slavery or the child of the flesh to be heir of Abraham. And through Isaac, the Lord said, He will establish a generation, a descendant in, the, in His name. And God promised that with Abraham. He said, Do not worry, for Isaac will be your people. And through the descendants of Isaac, Jesus Christ was born, and He is the blessing to all nations. We no longer rely on our own strength, for God blesses us. And this is the experience of Paul. Paul could be so proud of his accomplishments. He was proud that he, he could be proud that he was uh, of uh, uh, Benjamin of Benjamin. He is the one who was circumcised on eighth day. He kept the law even when he was little. He was the Pharisee of Pharisees. He, he, was, he persecuted those who follow Christ and he said that was the right way. But God had mercy upon Paul, a, a sinner a one who rebelled against God and went according to his own ways and relying on his own efforts. And now he was willing to leave it all. And he said, I see all those things as 
loss in order to have Jesus Christ. Everything that I have accomplished, my righteousness, my goodness, my accomplishments, all that He has done, He said, I see all those things as, I'm sorry, like dung. <laughs> so that I can be, so that I can have Christ. So, in verse 4, Though I myself have reason for confidence in the flesh also, if anyone else thinks he has reason for confidence in the flesh, I have more. He even said that. He was so proud. He could say, I am confident in what I have done. Circumcised on the eighth day of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, as to the law of Pharisee. That is, uh, they're, they keep the law to the to the dot as the zeal a persecutor of the church as to the righteousness under the law blameless but whatever gain I had I counted as loss for the sake of Christ for the sake of Christ he was willing to lose all those things indeed I count everything as loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord do you see Jesus as as, as worth worthy of all things if you don't see that Jesus is worth it then you will not pay the price for his sake I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish in here it, it is worse than rubbish in order to see all those things all the good things that he has accomplished he count them as rubbish in order that I may have Christ and be found in him not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law but that which comes from faith in Christ the righteousness from God that depends on faith God counts your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ as righteous and he receives you and accepts you only by faith but to have faith in Christ, we no longer have faith in ourselves, no longer relying on our own efforts to live anymore, but totally relying on Christ Jesus, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and may share his sufferings, becoming like him in his death, that by any means possible, I may attain the resurrection from the dead. That I, this word, hope, is to know for sure to know for sure, to have a true hope that you will be resurrected from the dead. So to have the joy. Uh, we see that athletes for the Olympics, they have to go through a lot of pain and, and suffering, right? They had to work, wake up prior to 4 o'clock in the morning to train themselves. There's this one young man who once participated in such a... Um, canoeing race when he was in Orlando and this young man he had to wake up very early and he would take this uh, long big uh, canoe that the whole team has to carry out and then they have to exercise and train themselves why what they're hoping for to get that uh, the, the reward and now what are we hoping for? We're hoping for, on the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ has paid everything to bring us salvation. But there's one thing that we must do, is that no longer we rely on our own self. We don't rely on our own efforts, but totally rely on the Lord. The price that is paid, it's a high price to pay, but the Lord Jesus is worthy, worth it. He is worth any price to have Him. The life of faith brings about great joy. We can laugh and rejoice, but the walk of faith often goes through the painful times. There are some of you right now going through difficult times, trials. Maybe you are worried and maybe even hopeless, and you're crying so much. And you say, why is it that to follow Christ, I have to pay, pay such a high price? And you don't understand why. Why is God doing what He's doing in your life? But God wants you to submit under His pruning and His correcting in you and trusting that the Lord will accomplish His promise for you according to His right timing when you are willing to leave your own self and cut off the old self to accept the pain. Then you will enjoy the, the utmost joy. 
that when we rely on the Lord for what He alone can give to us and do for us, that is the salvation that is from Him. When you will have the Lord Jesus, and when you have the Lord Jesus, you will have everything. And when you don't have Jesus, you have nothing. So let us come to the Lord in prayer. Father, we learned about joy and pain of the life of faith of following you. Lord, we have been given, been given the joy of having Jesus Christ. It, but the pain that we have to do is to cast out the old self, to cut off the flesh, things that we do by our own selves, so that we come to you and totally rely on you, Lord. And we lose ourselves in your love, Lord. And we come to you and to walk with you, live with you, for you reveal your life in us and through us so that the fruit of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, kindness, suffering, uh, long-suffering and patience and all that, Lord, will be revealed through us so that the fruit of righteousness will be accomplished through our lives, not by our own effort, Lord, but because we walk in the Holy Spirit and obey you, Lord. We thank you, Lord. We know, Lord, that by our own strength, we cannot do it. But if we are in you, Lord, your life, filled in us and overflowing through us, will accomplish only what you can do in us and for us. Thank you, Lord. May all the glory and power and glory and praise be to you forever and ever. In Jesus' name we pray.